Hey guys, it's April 1st, 2018. It's time to do the Q&A for the week. This week was on the topic of refeeds, free meals, cyclical strategies, um, metabolic resets, so stuff, anything related to that. Uh, I had some pretty good questions. There's a couple questions in here that aren't related to the topic that they were asked a couple weeks in a row and I kept missing them, so I'm going to go ahead and add those in there. Uh, just for those people that asked. That way, I don't keep missing them every week. But Facebook and Instagram again this week. So I'm going to pull up both threads and we will start on the IG threads. Okay. <clears throat> Do you notice trends in weight when a refeed is needed? I swear my weight spikes. I, I look much more watery. Could this be why? Uh, I mean, you may look more watery just because you're flat. You have that kind of, there's less pop, kind of makes that appearance of subcutaneous water. Even if there's not necessarily subcutaneous water, there could be some. Um, and typically when you have that refeed and you refill glycogen, any of that excess water is going to be pulled into the, the cell anyhow. So you have that tighter look and, uh, you know, not the appearance of water under the skin. As far as the weight spiking, um, <clears throat> it's definitely possible. I have clients that if their metabolic rate slows down enough, their weight will actually stall or go up. Um, and then we need a refeed from there to, to get things going again. It definitely happens. It's not, I would say that it's probably not the most common thing that I see, but it definitely does happen. And if it's a trend that I find in someone, normally what I'll find is that person's pretty regular in that regard. So their weight will go up. Uh, it'll go up. <clears throat> Maybe it's not, might not be very significant, but then we, we go ahead and implement a refeed. Um, and then their weight does go down. Maybe not the day after necessarily because of that glycogen, but within a couple days. They, things actually speed up and their weight does go down. So yeah, it definitely can happen that way. Um, all right. Question on potassium serum levels. So this was one of the ones that I missed before. I wanted to go ahead and cover it today. So <clears throat> what can cause potassium levels to be high? If there's any major concern, uh, more so when kidney values are within range or just bun being slightly elevated, creatinine, etc., all healthy within normal range. So, with the bun and creatinine, I mean, we know that those could potentially be healthy. I'm um, sorry, potentially be elevated with um, inflammation and just with our uh, higher protein diets. So, it's Disregarding those, if you said they're in range or just slightly elevated, uh, other reasons potassium can be high without kidney function being the issue. Honestly, what I see with most people in this arena uh, is hypoadrenal function. So just low adrenal function, maybe not, maybe not necessarily buried, but it will throw off electrolytes because it does interrupt aldosterone and just overall electrolyte imbalance. Uh, so what someone may see is even lower sodium and higher potassium. Maybe their sodium doesn't drop all the way out of range, but maybe the potassium bumps up out of range. I know mine does personally when I'm getting to that point of adrenal hypofunction. My adrenals are getting burnt out. My potassium serum will actually creep up and go out of range, even though kidney values are normal. And um, my sodium will be a little bit lower. So if you have old labs to compare to, maybe look at that and see what you think and kind of look at the other signs of obviously of um, adrenal hypofunction. So anything related to uh, adrenal insufficiency, that would be, you know, and all those are, all those are uh, pretty easy to figure out as far as how you feel, how you look, how your, how, you know, how your gym sessions are, all those things. So that's probably the most common thing that I see if it's not kidney related. <clears throat> okay. And, okay, another good one here. 
So post show during a let's see during a reverse diet thoughts on allowing or giving people an extra refeed or meal during the week to help them both physical and mental standpoint, uh, particularly people that struggle or are struggling with binge eating post show. <clears throat> well, I mean obviously biggest thing in this case is adherence. It doesn't matter if you have the best reverse diet strategy, the most optimal whatever. Uh, if they can't adhere to it and they're having big binges, then they're going to blow any kind of uh, caloric set point anyhow. Because as we know at this point, we are we are in a fragile state. Um, we can super compensate. You know, we can have that ability to initially handle a little bit extra food, but we're going to top off. Glycogen is going to top off. You will spill over and end up just getting fat and uh, <clears throat> those benches are obviously going to make it happen pretty quick because metabolism is still down-regulated. Hormones are probably still down-regulated at this point. So is it, it could be worth adding in an extra meal. Just depending on the person, I might actually just create a little bit smaller surplus and add in a couple extra meals during the week. Instead of one free meal, we might do two and just keep the... Uh, overall calorie surplus on the other days a little bit more modest than I would otherwise. If I know that it's mostly a mental thing, you know, where they're just, they have that free meal there to uh, to look forward to maybe midweek and then again on the weekend. I definitely do it like that if I need to. It's totally, if it's totally just a psychological thing. Um, <clears throat> it's physically... It's probably not a huge benefit to that, if any, just because if we're getting the, you know, if I'm getting the person into a surplus, we're going to start reversing all those adaptions anyhow. It's not really going to have a huge physical benefit to add those spike days in there like that initially. Um, so I would say it's probably more psychological than anything. But just getting the person into the surplus is going to help balance out all the neurotransmitters, mood, you know get dopamine and serotonin and all those things leveled where you're not getting all kinds of wacky hunger signals and feelings and mood. But uh, psychologically, definitely, it could be beneficial for sure. Okay. Does, does a refeed have its place on a caloric surplus, in a caloric surplus? So a refeed would be a refeed would be a carb generally is a, a higher carb situation where you're refeeding not necessarily it's not one meal it's an ex, you know more extended period that's going to help reverse those metabolic adaptions going to help increase metabolism uh, leptin thyroid function and what have you in a you know in a caloric surplus you don't have any of those things down regulated if you're been in a surplus for a while so no, there's really no benefit to a refeed and a surplus from the metabolic standpoint, necessarily. Um, but that's not to say that there's no benefit to caloric spikes at points. Um, there might be some benefit to it with people that you know need to eat a lot of calories and might just need caloric spike days of dirtier foods to just get the total caloric intake in. Um, spike days around potentially around more demanding training days or more demanding days in general could serve some benefit um, but but again a refeed by definition really wouldn't do really wouldn't have any uh, advantage metabolically in a surplus do you find benefits in fasts after refeeds or cheat meals? And if so, why? Or do you find it better to resume the normal diet instantly after the cheat meal or prolonged refeed? I definitely, I do it both ways. So one, one benefit that I found with a, with a fast, and I talked about this in a uh, recent podcast, at, at least in this situation would be, let's say somebody has a refeed. They do, they do a little bit more extended refeed. They're getting a pretty good metabolic effect from that. Okay, so now we have, they've been in a calorie surplus. Their metabolism is elevated. They're in a better fat, you know, fat burning state. 
So what we can do the day after is actually have them fast and do a lower calorie. Basically, if they're in prime fat burning mode, they can fast at that point. They can do extra cardio that day. They can, um, you know, their appetite's probably not going to be too bad. Might be elevated some from the refeed, but psychologically, you know, the cravings and all those things are normally down just because, uh, you know, just because they had that, that calorie spike previously. So it could definitely serve, you know, definitely have a benefit from the fat loss standpoint. I do like to do that. It's, it, that's just kind of goes back to the cyclical strategies. I would suggest going back and listening to the recent podcast that I did. I talked all about this topic and different strategies on how you can implement those fasts and how you can do that kind of up and down type of uh, approach with the refeeds. Now with the cheat meals, maybe if it's, if it's somebody that, you know, I'm implementing a cheat meal or free meal or whatever, just from a psychological standpoint or a spike day, and then they're going right into a non-training day or something like that. Yeah, I might have them fast. There could be benefits from digest, you know, just the standpoint of digestion, uh, getting their hunger reset and things of that nature, but it's not really going to be a fat loss type of strategy at that point because they are not having, uh, because I'm probably not using the sheet meals as a fat loss tool necessarily, whereas a refeed would be more so. Okay. Okay, next question. Let's see. Okay, so Lyle McDonald reference here says that a refeed of 10,000 calories boosts BMR back up by 100 calories a day. Uh, okay, so essentially... Essentially, this question is asking, is there, is it really worth doing a refeed? Because if it's only going to boost you uh, 100 calories a day, that's not going to offset the fact that you did a 10,000 calorie refeed, which is obviously correct. <laughs> On paper, that's not going to do anything. You're actually going to gain weight from that here. So it would be, you know, would render it completely pointless. Uh, well... <laughs> The issue, the issue with I see with that is that I never have done a ten thousand calorie refeed with anyone ever that I can think of. Um, so I would, you know, I would say that in most cases I find more benefit just getting people out of a calorie surplus for a shorter, you know, a little bit more extended period of time rather than just cramming in a bunch of calories as you know in a one day period. Even if I'm only having someone refeed for a day, because normally I like to, when someone's really down regulated, I like to kind of lean towards more of that two day, maybe a three day, if we can get away with it, if we have that luxury. Uh, but I've never, like I said, I'm never really doing a 10,000 calorie refeed or anything obscenely big like that. So typically, again, more of an extended refeed and a more modest surplus just to uh, just to get them out of the surplus. That's where I really see the benefit at, to be completely honest. And if it's a refeed for cosmetic effects, then yeah, I mean, I'm going to give them as much glycogen as they need to fill out. Uh, but a refeed for metabolic, strictly metabolic effect, I don't see any reason that it needs to be obscenely high like that. I've never, I've never had to take anyone that high. So uh, my response would be, don't do a 10,000 calorie refeed and <laughs> just get, get someone into a modest surplus for long enough to uh, get metabolic function moving again, get leptin up um, and get the benefit that way. So you're not just offsetting what you're doing there. There definitely is validity in, in this question though, because I mean, I do see this type of thing a lot where somebody's it's just a pig out day or it's a, you know, whatever, they're doing free meals, cheat meals, whatever. And obviously it's completely and entirely pointless from a metabolic standpoint, just because they're just going to completely offset what they're doing. Uh, it's, there was actually a question about this in one of the groups that I'm in talking about free meals. Um, for one, we know that a free meal is really not going to serve any kind of metabolic purpose. And secondly, <laughs> you can easily eat a two, three, four thousand calorie free meal, if it's a big meal, especially if you're a bigger person, 
and then that's going to offset your entire whatever two, three, four thousand calorie deficit that you created for the entire week. So again, pointless. So structure and length, I would say, is a little bit more important here than just quantity. Okay. Next one. Best strategies in fat loss phase, cardio weights, calorie deficit, or strategic combo of all. I kind of answered this one already on there just by simply saying that there's really no best strategy or combination. Uh, it's just totally person dependent. I mean, in general, I'm going to try to create the best combination of, of cardio weights and calorie deficit for that person in particular. And some people might lean a little more towards one side of things or the other. Some people are smack dab in the middle and need the combination of all of them. Uh, just totally depends on the person. So I can't really give a good answer to that one, unfortunately. <clears throat> okay, last one. Best foods or your go-tos for a good refeed. Okay, so I mean, this kind of depends on size of the refeed, the person's digestion, things like that. I mean, if it's not a huge refeed, someone has pretty good digestion, I don't like to do anything too crazy with the food as far as using processed sources and things like that. You can. I mean, it's not necessarily going to hurt anything. But in general, I want food sources that A, digest easily, and B, are going to not be a stupid high quantity that they're actually going to be able to get down from an appetite standpoint. However, I find that when most people that are pretty depleted actually start refeeding, their hunger goes up pretty quick. So once they, it kind of opens that floodgate. So they normally don't have any problems eating. But if they do, you know, we can definitely add processed sources. I mean, tons of easy things. Cereal, that's a super common one. You can get some kids cereal or whatever you like, and you can pound down hundreds of carbs, no problem. So that's probably one of the more common ones. For me personally, things that I like to use, I use kind of a mixture of, uh, you know, quote unquote clean and, and uh, more processed stuff. I'll do things, you know, common things like uh, potatoes or rice, but I'll also do, I love doing things like uh, flavored rice cakes. That's one of my favorite ones. I know you don't get a lot of carbs, per rice cake necessarily, but they're very light and airy. I can eat a whole 14 rice cake tube. I can eat a couple of those pretty easily. Um, things like cereal, I'll use like gluten-free pastas and gluten-free breads and things like that. Might even throw in a little bit of, uh, uh, let's see what I do the other day. It was like frozen yogurt. I mean, you can do stuff like that even, or sorbet. Um, if it digests well with you, I mean, there's, there's really lots of things you can do. Some people all do, uh, they'll make their own protein pancakes, you know, using just literally using pancake mix, which I mean, again, you can hammer down tons of carbs that way. We'll put carbs into workout, get a lot there. Um, I mean, there's limitless options. If it's right around training, if I want actually just really high glycemic stuff for the person, they can do things like gummy worms, gummy bears, any kind of candies like that. Um, we'll probably do the whole entire refeed with those kind of uh, super high GI type carbs, but I will, might do some of it with those and then kind of phase out into other carbs as we go on. But again, I mean, there's, there's not really, I should say there's not really anything that you can't use assuming it digests well with you. I would just be mindful of keeping inflammation in check. If you're using a ton of inflammatory foods, you know, processed foods that are really inflammatory, if that's all you're using and you have a pretty good quantity of it, then you might get some inflammation from that. Hold a little more water than you want to. But outside of that, I mean, you can use pretty much anything. Okay, I think that's all the questions for today, guys. So I will cut it off here and we'll talk to you guys again next week.